Hey guys, what's going on? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And first of all, I want to apologize real quick because I've been a little bit out of the loop. I mean, I've been putting out some videos, but it's not that I haven't been making videos. It's that uh, I am creating a whole Udemy course, a couple of them, for various topics that we can go more in depth and we can we can touch on. They're, they're going to be a little bit more focused and honed in but anyways I've been doing that so some of my attentions have been put away pardon me I have something in my eye and it doesn't want to go away but the the reason why we're doing this quick video here is because I got a, uh, I got a message from Natalie who is one of my subscribers and she's always asking great questions about the monomyth and today she asked if we could discuss the final battle in the monomyth and that's the reason why I haven't touched on it well there are a couple of reasons why I haven't touched on it before but it's uh, it's it's really important and I don't want to shortchange it but um, what I'm gonna try to do today is just give a, a brief overview give give some key points to consider during that part of your story so now that we've kind of cleared that up, now we go into, okay, you've had the brother battle, and towards the end, somewhere near the special world, what's going to happen is the hero is going to have to face the final showdown, the final confrontation, the final battle, the climax. And this is where the whole story has been been leading up to the underdog versus the 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 reigning champion so to speak and if you if you've developed both characters well enough this is the moment that everybody has been waiting for this is the moment everybody wants to see and the reason is because both characters represent the yin and the yang or the the dichotomy of your theme and that theme the edge of that theme is going to be played through whatever the boon is but that's that's for other videos that I've already done so in this fight what you're going to have is you'll have the whole team has been allocated so so once the once the hero is the mentor is gone the hero is going back to the special world with the boon or maybe after the boon the key here is that the hero is no longer running away from the fight. The hero is, and the hero is also no, no longer running towards a fight, per se. The hero has entered, he's left warrior mode, which he was in, kind of in the cave and the dragon battle and, and leading up to this. And now he's in martyr mode, which is the most important mode of all the modes in the hero's journey. In this is something that Joseph Campbell has written and spoken about to, to great lengths, which is basically when one decides to sacrifice oneself, when one decides to accept death, that is, that is the ultimate power. Because now you become one with the divine. Now you have the ability to be reborn. And the only way to do that is through facing the, the final battle. It's through going to the antagonist's home or straight up to the, the villain and facing him head on without anybody there to help you, okay? So normally what happens is it's not like the team is going to abandon the hero. The team may have been allocated to do special jobs. You go here and sabotage this. You go here and do that. Or maybe, maybe they all came together, but what happened was they got split up. Some of them got taken. Some of them were trapped. Some of them fought so that the hero could continue on. Okay? All of these things can happen. But at some point, the hero comes face to face with the villain. And this here, this is where a lot of writers, uh, this is a great scene for the whole story. And a lot of writers do a great job. The, the battle is good. It's fun. It's action-packed. But where you separate great writers from good writers from great writers is 
is in this point, okay? The hero doesn't just face the villain physically. He faces them ethereally, thematically. That's, that's what I'm looking for, thematically, okay? At some point, the hero, whether through actions, words, representation symbolically, however you do it, the hero does something that the villain could never do or fathom that wins the day. And it's because whatever it is that the hero does, that is, and a lot of times it is sacrifice, okay? Most villains aren't willing to sacrifice themselves. They'll, they'll sacrifice anything else, but not themselves. That's a big key there. But it's, they do something that the villain is incapable of doing, not because they're not physically capable, but because they're, they're philosophically in contradisposition to whatever that might be, right? One of the, one of the better depictions I've seen of this recently is in Guardians of the Galaxy at the end when when despite all the fighting of the Nova Corps and and Star Lord and his team and the Ravagers, the Ronin gets down to the planet and he has the gem. And he's about to unleash his power. And Star Lord, what does he do? He 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 becomes a martyr. He sacrifices himself. First, he distracts Ronin. By again doing something Ronan would never do, he, he's acting silly and and acting doing a dance off, but he's distracting Ronan. The second thing, though, that he does is he grabs the the gem with his with his bare hands, full well knowing because of stuff that's happened earlier in the story that as soon as he touches that, he's gonna die. He knows this because he's seen it happen to someone else before. The writer made a great setup to show us what happens. But Star-Lord, who in the beginning started out as someone who never does anything for other people, he's only in it for himself, he's kind of an anti-hero, he's, he's, not, he's not there, he doesn't have a team, he doesn't care about other people, he cares about himself. He's making the ultimate sacrifice by grabbing on to the gym which that in and of itself so the writer is showing like there's no physical fighting going on right now it's sacrifice and it's not just sacrifice of life it's sacrifice of star lord's general being he's normally a selfish guy and here he is taking the sacrifice for the whole universe the galaxy right and then the writer takes it even deeper. And, and this, is, this was some really great damn writing, if you ask me. He brings you back to the prologue, the very beginning, when we meet Star-Lord as a child. And we see what made him the way he was, was his mother dying of, we assume, cancer, right? And he, he doesn't hold on to her hand, not because he doesn't love her, because he loves her so much, he knows if he holds her hand, it's letting go. I'm getting teary. I just think about it right now. It's a very touching moment for everybody in the audience because that's that's the key that the writer is trying to show is that no matter what odds you face, even if it's someone like Ronan, some eternal being that has all this power, that if everybody comes together as a team, because what happens next? Star Lord's team, the the guardians, come and hold his hand to help him survive the gym. Okay, it's a very impactful moment, and it, and you want to talk about someone who wrote the theme perfectly into this. I mean, just brilliantly orchestrated. They're all holding hands together, all sharing the power, but also the pain of the gym. And because of that, they're able to make they're able to withstand the destruction of the gym, and and Ronan is not. And Ronan, on the other hand, ends up being destroyed. And it's a, it's a perfect example where you have two things going on. Something in the physical world that is symbolically representing something that's going on thematically, which the hero has been struggling with as a character the entire story. 
And there are other examples, you know, I mean, one, a very short one that I can think of is Luke releasing the targeting device and using the force in order to shoot that final moment in the Death Star. That, too, is speaking thematically. And the final, the final showdown there is, is Luke not only versus Darth Vader, but Luke is the one who has to overcome his fear of messing up and trust in himself, which is the ultimate theme of that. The, the whole point of the Force and all this other stuff, the ultimate theme is trust in yourself. Don't rely on machines and systems to run your life all the time, right? So I hope with all those examples, it gives you a good idea of, you know, what the, I mean, it's, that is the culmination of the hero's journey, is if you can get the final battle to have the villain, the hero, and their, and their team work in such a way that they, they have to thematically show that the way they defeat the villain, the antagonist, is through a thematic representation of what the whole story means. If you do that, the story is going to be powerful. The story is going to touch the heartstrings. The story is going to resonate with your readers, especially if you've picked a good theme to touch on, especially if you pick something that is relevant to today's audience, relevant to issues that we face in the world today. So I hope this is helpful. Um, I'm sure I left something out, you know, they, this, the, the, the great thing and the, and the, the curse about the model myth is the more you explore it, the more questions there are, the more things that you can talk about, the more rabbit holes you can go down, which is why I'm creating courses on Udemy to really dig deep, to really get into the, the nuts and bolts of like every single thing about this. But for, the, for now, I hope that I have satisfied the hunger and, and satisfied the question. So, uh, Natalie, thanks for the question. It was a great question. For everybody else out there who watches the videos, I hope this has added value. I hope this has given you a deeper understanding, not only of the, the final battle scene, but, you, you know, your writing, the monomyth, and hopefully yourself. So, until next time, you guys, take it easy.